Alrighty, so um, I, we decided to, to Los Alamos Medical Center just to kind of give an overview of a little bit about Ebola and, and kind of what we've been doing to prepare our hospital as well as um, in preparation for the community in dealing with this. As you all know, this has been such a very hot topic out in the news and every day it just seems like there's more and more information that comes out. For us, this has been a little bit of a moving target just because of the fact that the CDC every day is coming out with new guidelines, new recommendations, and so we've been trying to keep up with that. Um, and we think we have a plan and then the CDC identifies something else and then our plans change. So I can probably guarantee you that what I'm going to share with you today will probably change by next week again just because this continues to be a moving target for us. So just an overview of Ebola, um, it began in West Africa, um, this latest outbreak in December of 2013. So far to date it has infected about 10,000 people and killed more than 4,400 people so far. Really, Ebola has been around for a very long period of time. It was first identified back in 1976. Um, so this is not something brand spanking new that we're dealing with or hearing about because it has been around. What we've found with Ebola, though, is that it kind of comes and goes in uh, waves, if you will, and in outbreaks. Um, since Ebola has been around in 1976, this particular outbreak that began in December of 13 has been the deadliest outbreak thus far. So what is Ebola? Basically it's a hemorrhagic fever. Um, patients um, run very high fevers. They have lots of problems with bleeding. Um, and the fatality rate, the unfortunate thing, is about 50 percent. Um, so if you are diagnosed with Ebola or catch Ebola, um, obviously the chances of surviving that are, are uh, not very good. Um, truly it is transmitted via direct exposure of broken skin or mucous membranes of body fluids from those infected. So if you were just sitting in a room with someone, like from me to, to Mary Beth, and Mary Beth was infected and she coughed or sneezed or whatever, the chances of me getting it are very, very slim because I'm not coming into any direct contact with her. Now, if I was sitting where Jackie and Mary Beth are and Mary Beth decided to sneeze all over Jackie and Jackie had some sores on her you know, skin or face or whatever and her body fluids went in there, then Jackie would be at a high risk of um, contracting the disease. Incubation is about two to 21 days, although so far right now the average has been about eight to 10. Um, and truly it's not contagious until symptoms appear. So the common symptoms are fever, usually greater than 100.4. You're gonna have headache, you're gonna have muscle pain, you're gonna have nausea, you're gonna have vomiting, you're gonna have diarrhea, um, and s potentially some explained, unexplained hemorrhage, you know, some sort of bleeding or bruising or something that you're noticing on the skin. Treatment, unfortunately right now there is no FDA approved vaccines or medicines. They are working on something right now. Um, they're going through some laboratory trials, but nothing has truly been identified as being a clear uh, cure for this uh, disease. Um, so right now we're basically treating the symptoms as they appear. Lots of IV fluids, hydration, lots of uh, medication for the nausea, uh, medications for the diarrhea, things like that. Um, recovery truly depends on the good supportive care that you get from the care team that's caring for you as well as the patient's own immune response. So if you're a fairly healthy patient, have a fairly strong immune response and um, you were to contract it, you would be better able to overcome it than somebody who was immune compromised who had some sort of an uh, immune uh, disease. Um, there has been though some talk about uh, a blood transfusion from a person who has already had Ebola being successful and um, that um, I know the first nurse that was diagnosed out of Dallas she had um, a blood transfusion from uh, an Ebola survivor and I they're contributing to that as being why she's doing so well because once you have contracted Ebola and you survive you're immune you're you've got basically got an immunity for that for up to 10 years so basically what they're doing is those antibodies that are running around in the blood, they're using that to kind of jumpstart a person's uh, immunity who already has it. 
So how did this current uh, Ebola outbreak spread? It started uh, when a child contracted the virus back in December of 2013. By the end of March of 14, there were more than 100 cases were identified in those three Western countries in Africa. Um, this outbreak, the problem with it is that it has been able to jump or evade healthcare workers because of the ease of travel. Um, it's uh, very easy to travel in and around Africa and there's really no guidelines or no um, stopping points and so people have been able to migrate back and forth and so that's made it very easy to spread. Um, a while ago, I don't remember the exact years, but um, Central Africa had had an outbreak of Ebola, but they were able to manage it very, very well. And it's because they were equipped, they had identified it, they um, had resources and were able to respond to it very quickly and get it kind of contained. West Africa is not as a developed part of Africa, and so they've had a much more difficult time kind of containing it and trying to manage resources around to treating it. And then of course most of you probably know it did arrive in the U.S. in late September with our gentleman who um, uh, was in Dallas. Oops. Oh. Hang on, I'm sorry. I think I skipped a slide, so I want to go back. Okay, there. Okay, so um, some of the talk right now um, has been how do we treat it in the United States and what do we do? Um, and there's been, the CDC has kind of come out with two different things. Uh, one is should we just have a few select hospitals in the United States that have been, you know, sufficiently trained and have the sufficient equipment and manpower to be able to treat Ebola? Or should we designate one hospital in each of the states that's kind of that specialized hospital? So currently right now in the United States there are four hospitals um, that are uh, I have been identified as being able to treat Ebola. One is St. Patrick Hospital in Missoula, Montana. They have three beds. They have not treated anybody with Ebola to date. Uh, of course, Nebraska Medical Center, they have three beds and they have treated. Emory University in Georgia um, has two beds and they've treated. And then Bethesda, Maryland has one bed. Um, for New Mexico specifically, um, I'm hearing through the state that UNM will probably be our designated state hospital if there were some rural hospitals that um, had an Ebola case that potentially is the facility that we would try to transfer to. So how is Ebola spread? It's spread through direct contact, through blood or body fluids, or through objects like needles and syringes that have been contaminated um, by a person e infected with Ebola, infected animals. Um, Ebola is not spread through air or water or by food, generally by food. So that's important because I think that's a myth out there. A lot of people, you know, are afraid, well, if I'm in the same room as someone or, you know, someone from across the room coughs or sneezes, am I gonna, am I gonna catch it? And, and at this point in time, uh, no. Um, and there's also no uh, evidence to support that insects are transmitting the virus, only mammals, and that's also been a concern. Am I going to get Ebola through mosquitoes? Right now, no. It's mainly going to be, if from an animal standpoint, bats, monkeys, and apes are the more common mammals that are um, spreading that disease. Uh, this is sensitive. So what does direct contact mean? I kind of already talked about that. It just basically means that body fluids, either blood, saliva, mucus, vomit, urine, or feces from an infected person, either alive or dead, um, have touched someone's eyes, nose, mouth, open cut, wound, or abrasion of the skin. Okay, so who can get Ebola? Um, persons who have resided or traveled um, to um, any of these three Western African countries or who potentially came in direct contact with a person who has um, traveled to those areas 
um, and within those 21 days after exposure. So how long does Ebola live outside of the body? Um, Ebola can be killed with hospital grade disinfectant, which is the good news. So we here at Los Alamos Medical Center, we've taken the CDC guidelines and recommendations, we've reviewed all of our disinfecting equipment and cleaning supplies, and we have identified that what we currently have in stock is strong enough to take care of the Ebola virus. Um, the other recommendation is also using bleach, a 10% bleach solution, and uh, we do also have um, bleach cleaning products on hand as well. Um, hard surfaces should be cleaned regularly with these disinfectants. Um, and the CDC is saying right now that the virus really only survives up to 24 hours um, on a hard surface. And if you clean it, clean it, clean it, and then after 24 hours, the virus should be gone. Now Ebola though, if it's in a body fluid, can survive up to several days at room temperature. So that's why they're saying, you know, you need to contain any of these body fluids from people who have been diagnosed with Ebola because that virus is still going to, to cause a problem. So we need to get it contained, we need to get it cleaned up, we're going to red bag anything, um, Stericycle, our waste management um, company, um, they have been uh, in consult with the CDC. They know how to take those products out of our facility. We know how to properly contain them, red bag them. We're going to bag them three times um, and then get them in a um, solid waste container uh, for transport. So protective equipment. So there are two recommendations right now from the CDC as far as what type of protective equipment. Um, you should be using. Uh, the first one is full coverage with gowns, double gloving, boot covers, head covers, N95 respirators, and face shields. Basically, the objective is that there should be no skin exposure. We don't want any part of a healthcare provider's skin to be exposed whatsoever. Um, and then the second recommendation is with a PAPR, which is a personal um, airway kind of device that you put the hood over your head and you wear like a little uh, uh, battery pack and it's got filters and then it's got a blower on it and it actually blows air into your hood. Like kind of like an astronaut, yeah. And then um, full piece Tyvek suits. So, um, you know, kind of like an astronaut, <laughs> you know, they get into these full, you know, one piece suits and then with this hood and, and everything. Um, but again, the objective is we don't want any part or piece of a healthcare provider skin exposed, so it's complete coverage. And these um, head covers up here on the first one are those uh, not just something that goes up over your head, they're actually ones that come down here above the eyebrow, kind of come down and just come kind of underneath your lip, and then they've got um, a big long kind of um, shroud, if you will, that comes over the top of your shoulders. So it will cover your neck and, and everything. And right now, we're currently training in the use of both of those. We have um, lots of these PAPRs um, in our ER, um, and um, we've got plenty of the other supplies. We've uh, Earlier, uh, two weeks ago, we went through, we looked at our supplies, we tried to identify what it is we had on hand and what we felt we needed, and um, at this point in time, we feel like we're in good shape. So currently right now, there have been uh, four patients that have been affected in the United States. Of course, the Liberian gentleman who um, unfortunately uh, died in Dallas, then the two nurses that treated that patient in Dallas, and now more recently, um, that physician in New York. And that physician in New York um, was a physician who worked with um, a nonprofit organization called Physicians Without Borders, and he had been down to Western Africa and had actually been treating patients with Ebola, had been flown back into the United States, um, had been doing well, and then um, unexpectedly just developed the fever, and um, then he's, he has now been confirmed. So um, the good news, I think, is right now is that the only two people that have been confirmed to have um, had Ebola from the gentleman in Dallas are those two nurses. And we're past that time frame now. We're past that 21 days. Everybody down there has been monitored very, very closely. And there have been no new signs or symptoms from that particular case. So that's the good news. Uh, unfortunately, now this physician in New York, that's a brand new case. And now there's a whole bunch of other people that will have to be monitored 
And right now, at this point in time, we're just going to have to keep our fingers crossed and hope that nobody else um, pops up as having symptoms from that particular physician. Gosh. So I have a silly question. Uh -huh. is, um, you know, for as nervous as are, how do these two nurses end up getting it? Well, the CDC really hasn't come out and said. There's been a whole lot of speculation. Um, part of the speculation is that um, they did not have full body coverage because at the time that the gentleman in Dallas was diagnosed, the CDC was not recommending full coverage. Okay. So they were wearing N95 respirators, they were wearing um, um, some sort of hat or hood, but their neck area wasn't covered. They were wearing gowns, they were wearing gloves, and I believe they were wearing the booties, you know, that come up to about your knees, but I don't think there was any coverage here. So some are speculating that it was because of this. Some are saying that there was a um, breach in their um, sh uh, shrouding or uh, doffing mm -hmm. process. So when they took the, the, uh, their PPE off, they didn't follow recommended guidelines and they somehow contaminated themselves in that doffing off process. Right, or just, you know, not realizing it because it's quite a process to get all of this PP on and then it's quite a process to take it off and you have to be very, very careful. So if I had gloves on and I was trying to take off my glove, my last set of gloves, because you usually double glove, if I was going in underneath like this to take off my last glove and I had contaminant on my glove and I had a hangnail, for example, here, and part of my finger touched the outside of that glove that was contaminated mm -hmm. and I didn't realize it, well then I've just you know, exposed myself. So since all of that happened, the CDC has come out with a, a new process now of how to take off all of this PPE and um, it's really washing your hands after every step that you take. So you, you, know, you wash your hands and then you take off your booties. You wash your hands and then you take off the top layer of your gloves. You wash your hands and then you take off your gown. You wash your hands and then you take off your hood. You wash your hands and then you take off the mat. I mean, it's quite a lengthy process to even get out of this just to ensure the fact that you don't contaminate yourself. And those recommendations were not in place when this gentleman came in, so. Um, so what you, should you do if you think someone might have Ebola? Um, obviously, you're going to assess their travel history. Unfortunately, we're heading into the flu season. You're going to, if you work in healthcare, you're going to run into people who are going to come in and say, I have the flu or I have a fever. And we don't want panic. There's no point in everybody panicking and going to the back room and, you know, gowning up on these space suits, if you will, and coming out to try to treat a patient. Really assess the travel history and ask them, are you running a fever? If yes, then have you traveled outside of the United States within the last 21 to 30 days? If so, where have you gone? If they're like, oh, well, I've been down in Australia. Well, okay, maybe that's not significant. If they said, oh, yeah, I've been down in West Africa. Okay, that's significant. Then let's prepare ourselves for what we need to do to treat that person. Um, have they been in contact, close contact, with anybody who has traveled outside of the United States? If so, where has that person traveled to? So let's, you know, assess that. Let's figure that out before we, we, you know, raise the alarms and sound the panic button. If positive for travel in Western Africa, um, for any of the symptoms listed above in my earlier slide, like, you know, fever, nausea, vomiting, diarrhea, you know, weakness, muscle pain, anything like that, and you're at home or you're in a, um, someplace else besides the hospital setting, you're going to call 911 and we have coordinated with the fire department here in town. Um, that person should be isolated into some sort of room, preferably a room that has a bathroom. Um, so for example, if you go over to a friend's house to ch and your friend is sick, um, you know, you want your friend to stay inside the house, you want them to be close to a bathroom, and you want to call 911 if you suspect that they might have Ebola based upon their travel history and their symptomology, um, and wait for EMS to arrive. When EMS arrives, they will have their uh, appropriate protective equipment on. So when you call 911, there's going to be a lot of screening that's going to happen over the phone, um, asking a whole bunch of questions because basically they want to prepare those uh, fire department people um, to make sure that they know what they're walking into. So don't be alarmed if you see EMS people walking in with you know, full Tyvek, you know, suits and big hooded respirators because that's what they will wear. 
Um, EMS will then assess themselves and see if that person meets criteria for Ebola. Um, if they feel, then they will transport to us for further evaluation. Before they ever leave the home, though, they will be calling us and letting us know what situation they're in so that we have time to prepare. Um, because obviously when that patient gets to our facility, we don't want to be taking them halfway through the hospital. We have it set up to where we have an isolated area. We have two rooms back in our ED. We have a full decontamination room and we also have an isolation room. So these patients would go into one of those two areas and we would prepare accordingly. I don't know why this is, I apologize. Okay, so let's talk about what we've done to prepare. Um, so like I've said, we've identified two different spaces in the ER to keep and treat patients. Uh, several weeks ago, we assessed our protective equipment in the hospital and have ordered additional supplies and equipment as we felt we needed to. We've done uh, some education of those protective equipment devices um, and we've practiced donning and doffing um, with the staff and of course that'll continue to be ongoing. Um, we've identified what screening questions we want to ask and we've got it set up to, uh, for any entrance into the hospital. Um, those questions are being asked um, and we've got lots of entries not only just the ED, but the front registration desk, we've got PT, we've got outside clinic areas, uh, we've worked with the um, clinics around us, um, Manum and LAMCC we've been working with um, as well. Um, CDC came out with a hospital preparedness checklist. We did complete that and identified that um, where we sat right now, or at least last week with those recommendations, we were sitting really good. There were a few things we needed to work on. Uh, we have completed a tabletop exercise with county agencies last Wednesday and that went well and we will continue those um, uh, meetings with them. Um, I had a meeting uh, Friday morning with uh, one of the physicians over at Lanel and uh, we will probably have another meeting uh, or at least that's our attempt to have another meeting with the fire department um, and also the police department hopefully sometime this week. Um, this coming week, we will begin our live drills in the ER. Uh, we've got all of the equipment now, and we will actually go through, practice having a patient, we'll practice donning, we'll practice doffing, we'll practice putting them in an isolation room, we'll, we'll have the physicians practice doing all of that, and we'll see how well our plan on paper actually works in reality. Um, my goal will be to have uh, one live drill every week until we get to the point to where we feel that the staff are fairly comfortable and it's pretty automatic. Um, we are participating in the New Mexico Depa Department of Health calls along with the C CDC calls and um, CDC usually have calls daily. New Mexico Department of Health is having them about a couple times a week um, but pretty frequently there's lots of calls out there. Um, I could probably spend all day just being on calls I think if I wanted to. Um, we will continue to assess uh, our status as far as um, preparedness as new guidelines are released and we will continue to tweak our plans as we go along. And uh, we are also in coordination um, and get lots of support, support from our LifePoint um, corporate uh, entity and helping to ensure that we're ready. So basically the takeaways is LAMC um, is preparing for Ebola. Uh, for most people, the risk is low. Uh, more people die each year from other health-related diseases like the flu. I mean, everybody, nobody's really too afraid of the flu. We all get flu vaccines, but um, you'd be astonished at the number of people that die each year from the flu. I mean, that's just astounding. Um, but here's what you can control. So, you know, if you're worried about it and you don't know and you really want to protect yourself and your family, wash your hands frequently. Clean hands save lives. You've seen that little probably uh, around maybe TV commercials or whatever. Clean hands do save lives. Don't touch or have contact with bodily fluids of those who are sick. Avoid touching your eyes, nose, and mouth with unwashed hands. We're all really good about, we probably don't even realize how many times a day we actually touch our face um, without realizing it. Disinfect your home and your belongings regularly, particularly this time of year. I know uh, about this time of year, I put hand sanitizer out on my kitchen counter and I have a, a little thing of Clorox wipes that I sit out there as well and I try to get my, my husband and my kids to you know wipe things down, doorknobs, countertops, 
you know, things like that. Um, and I, I think it works. Uh, we seem to do well with not getting sick at my house. Um, and cover, oh, I have a misspelled word, sorry about that. Cover your mouth and nose when coughing or sneezing, meaning use a tissue or your elbow. Um, you know, don't use your hand. I think that's the first reaction when somebody goes to cough or sneeze, we want to use our hand. Um, now you've just gotten germs on your hand and then you go touch a doorknob and now the doorknob has germs and then you pat somebody on the shoulder and now, you know. So use a tissue, sneeze into the tissue or use your elbow and sneeze into your elbow like that. And then that way you're, you're containing it. And that is all I have. Are there any questions that anybody has? Um, they do not let us know. Um, all I can say about LANO, of course you'd have to speak with them directly, but I do know they have suspended their travel assignments outside of the United States and have kind of um, restricted those travels. So they're not, as far as I know, they're not sending anybody um, outside of the United States right now until this kind of can be contained. Any comments? Yeah. So he was. Is there any responsibility? Uh, you know, yeah. Accountability. Accountability. Or, yeah. So um, I saw in a uh, release from, oh, lovely, Doctors Without Borders that they were self monitoring him. They had a monitoring program that they were doing with him, and he himself was monitoring his own health. Is that. The best way to do it, you know, I don't know. At this point in time, or you're, for, the, for the 21 days. Yeah, should people who come back, and it'll be interesting to see what CDC comes yeah, back with now. Yeah, um, sh when people come back, like Physicians Without yeah. Borders, come back into the United States, should they just be quarantined for those 21 days until we make sure that they're not yeah. going to become active? Yeah. Um, I don't think the, CD the CDC hasn't been real strict about that and um, haven't made any new guidelines. I know um, as I've been reading one of the things that they've been talked about is should we ban tra travel and should we not allow anybody to travel to West Africa? And what the CDC's response on that right now is that no, we don't want to recommend not, or uh, we don't want to recommend banning travel because right now we can monitor people that are coming in and out of the United States. We have processes in place. We know who's been there. We know who's coming back in, and we can monitor them. If we ban travel, what they're afraid of is then people will figure out a sneaky way to go there and a sneaky way to come back into the United States, and now we could potentially have people in the United States that we don't know was ever there. And I've also heard a rumor. Now, I haven't read this anywhere. This is strictly rumor. But I've heard a rumor now what people are doing is before they travel back into the United States and they're going through airports, they're taking a whole bunch of ibuprofen to decrease their fever so that the people at the airports don't identify that they have a fever. So uh, yeah, we'll, we'll see what the CDC does with that. Now, I don't know how true that is, well, but like that's. in the case of this physician, it, you know, he didn't get it right away. His fever was fine when he came back. Yeah. But yeah. 21 days is a long time, but how, well, he went to a bowling alley. <laughs> I know it. He I mean, rode a subway. He went to know, a bowling alley. Yeah. Yeah. That, if I was the physician. CDC, if I was the CDC, yeah. that's my recommendation. And it's, I would say, anybody who yeah. comes back from Western Africa, we, we need to quarantine you for 21 days and not allow you out in the general public. Because it's going to take actions, I think, as strong as that to ensure that we can contain the outbreak here in the United States. 
but I don't work for the CDC, yeah. so. <laughs> <laughs> My viewpoints and opinions probably don't matter a whole lot. <laughs> so, okay. Thank you very much. Thank you.